Welcome to our first ever table talk. I'm kind of excited. Are you guys good? Okay, so this is going to be a bit of an interesting exploration. My working draft for this table talk, for this section, the study session, was going to be nascent notes from Nicaea, which is incredibly boring. So uh, let me just put it a little better and settle you at ease. We're going to engage a little bit of church history. We're going to engage a bit of theological reflection, but I think you'll find the payoff is grand. We're going to call this one Holding Mystery Together. So in this table talk, we're actually going to dive into a very important event outside of the biblical canon. This occurred in about 325 AD in a city called Nicaea. A very important conversation that happened at the table. In the year 325, Christians from around the globe got together at the town of Nicaea to talk about the deep things of God and in order to sit in the mystery of who God is together. The scenario that drew people to the table was in fact an early church controversy, a big one. There was a man named Arius who had a teaching, very persuasive teaching. He taught that Jesus was less than the deity that God was. And the way he articulated it became a problem, really, for the global church. So just who was Jesus in relation to God? Meanwhile, another key figure in this debate, a chap named Athanasius, well, he didn't quite see it the way that Arius saw it. And so, from all over the world, all over the world, they gathered together in a city called Nicaea, and they had a big conversation. What exactly was the nature of the controversy? Was this really a big deal? And why am I talking about this event to begin with? Just to get a sense of the gravity of the scenario, let's look at one historian's perspective. So the question arose, did worshiping Christ as God mean that Christians believed in two gods? Was he God in the same sense that God, the creator, was God? Or was he a divine being ranked below the creator? It's a great way to put the question. You see how this is a big topic. Some would say the Arian controversy was the single biggest challenge the church ever faced. Wow. They bemoaned the outbreak of a controversy that threatened to divide the church at the time when persecution had finally come to an end and new opportunities and challenges needed to be met. So here in the beginning of the fourth century, we have the first Christian emperor, which we're going to unpack a little bit more. But church history to this point had been largely shaped by persecution. So now that Christians could freely gather at the table, well, is this really what they wanted to talk about? Controversial topics? Well, before I move on and over-glorify this event in church history, let me remind you that no event in human history is perfect. And in diving into different historians' takes on what happened at the Council of Nicaea, you'll find some more glossy than others. But among the challenges at Nicaea, they're pretty notable. I just want to take tally of them real quick before we end up assuming that this kind of productive conversation is out of our reach or is somehow unachievably perfect. So one looming problem is Constantinianism. The guy that ordained this conversation that brought people together is actually the first Christian emperor. And there are a lot of problematic things about the idea of a Christian emperor. And so there's a whole set of problems we might name after this person, Constantinianism, from Constantine. It's an overreach of political and imperial power into the matters of the church. And even though this was a really good and important conversation that the church had in its early days, it also introduces a whole host of issues with politics and faith. Not everybody was on their best behavior at this table talk. And might I warn you that we hope not to shoot for these kind of conversations, or at least the way they handled them. They had tantrums, violent outbursts from impassioned participants. You guys ever heard of the story of Saint Nick, like the Saint Nick, like the one you're thinking of when I say Saint Nick, actually punching Arius in the face while it happened. And thus a host of memes associated with this event. Deck the halls, try deck the heretic. Homotius. That's, we'll get into that later, but that has to do with the Greek words they were using to define who Jesus was in relation to God the Father. I gotta find out it's not your nice. 
Okay. You get the idea. It wasn't an ideal event. There was some bad behavior. There was even one bishop that that took the, the guy's notes and, and smashed him on the ground and ripped him up and, and stepped on him. And there is the challenge of romanticism, as I've already alluded to, that even in the historical account written by Eusebius, who has a very glossy view of Constantine and the whole the whole affair, it's a it's a little bit overdone. It's a little bit too glossy to be real. No event that any church ever throws is totally perfect. And either was this one. Why on earth are we spending time looking at the Council of Nicaea then? What do we hope? to learn from this pursuit and how is this helping us as a church family engage the challenging issues we face today? Well, I believe you'll find some bounty at the table. So some key takeaways from this event that I want to highlight. One, the mystery of God is at the center of our faith. Two, the global church needs to be in dialogue. Three, Speaking with clarity is important. Four, we must hold together the whole Bible. Five, we believe that God is active now. So here's some key points we're going to explore through looking at this event. Are you guys ready? What happened at the Council of Nicaea was the forging of the doctrine of the Trinity. In so many ways, the doctrine of the Trinity was attempting to articulate what Scripture revealed in a coherent and collective way. What do they see the relationship between God, the Son, and later the Spirit? What are their inner workings? What I observe is that they sought clarity, but they sought limited clarity. There was still much mystery of God that remained, and that is what they chose to embrace. Oversimplification was a huge problem. It was actually oversimplifying things that became an issue for Arius and his contemporaries. And thus, it threatened the church. So church, have we lost the ability to have nuanced conversations? If most of our conversations are happening in 140 characters or less, all over social media, impersonally, where algorithm and brevity of response dictate how we have productive conversations. How much clarity can we really obtain in this way? Where we flatten each other's views and shun nuance. So if you've ever studied the doctrine of the Trinity, or you you even have heard Trinitarian formulas, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we talk about this in church life, you hear about it, you read some of it in scripture, But it's not quite spelled out specifically and systematically in Scripture. But what we're left with is the idea of God's threeness and his oneness. So you could think of it mathematically something like this. Three equals one, one equals three. It doesn't make a whole lot of logic. It's really hard to hold together these mysteries. How is God both three and one? The problem comes not from holding together mystery, but from attempting to eliminate nuance and to oversimplify. Let me give you an example. Modalism is a problematic way of looking at the tri-unity of God by overemphasizing God's oneness. That might be problematic. It's almost like Jesus and, and the Spirit and the Father are just kind of masks that they put on. It's not quite what the scriptures reveal. And tritheism, that's when you go the other direction and you overemphasize the threeness of God. So do you see how this can be a challenge nested within the mystery of God and who God is and who he reveals himself to be is an inability to oversimplify and nuance is needed. Do we treasure nuance? Therefore, there is only limited clarity about who God is. Clarity indeed, God does reveal a lot about himself but not everything. So what is the Nicene Creed? What is this doctrine of the Trinity? Well, let me just go ahead and let you know the statement that they came up with, that they felt represented the biblical way of looking at the inner workings of God. This particular translation of their text highlights a couple of key Greek words, one of which we're going to explore further. Are you guys ready? This is the Creed of Nicaea. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things seen and unseen, 
and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same being as the Father, through whom all things came to be, both the things in heaven and on earth, who for us humans and for our salvation came down and was made flesh, becoming human, who suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. The Catholic, meaning universal, and apostolic church condemns those who say concerning the Son of God that there was a time when he was not, or he did not exist before he was begotten, or he came to be from nothing, or who claim that he is of another substance, hypostasis, or essence, usia, or a creation, or changeable, or alterable. I know that was a mouthful, but I think you understand that the weight of this conversation between Arius, between Athanasius, about the nature of who Jesus is was a key conversation worth seeking clarity on. It was a conversation of deep consequence. I don't know if we can come up with a conversation more consequential than that. What I think is fascinating here is that they embraced limited clarity. They believed the scriptures revealed something about Jesus and God, the Father, and the Spirit, but they did not believe that it worked out every detail. And so to this point, let's seek some advice from Timothy Ward. To claim that scripture is clear is not to claim that it fully expounds every matter on which it touches, for God obviously determines that there are some things which we do not need to know. Remember Paul? Now we see in part, as through a glass dimly. There is, inevitably, in the life of faith, and Christian discussion, thought, exploration, the mystery of God. And so we have this mystery at the center, at the heartbeat of our faith. God in and of himself is somehow a fellowship. Is this not a mystery too deep for our minds to fathom? There's all these theological terms that you can find in attempting to articulate who God is through scripture and understanding the Trinity. You get words like perichoresis, which is interpenetration, which is a mutual danceling where they encircle one another. What? All these terms simply are vague and vain attempts, in some regard, to capture the mystery of who God is, and holding together what he has revealed with clarity, with certainty, but limited clarity. We understand only in part. It's faith-seeking understanding. I want to return to the mystery of God at the end of this pr presentation to unpack and to reflect more about how this idea, this unsimplifiable idea is at the core of our faith. Perhaps we, being made in the image of God, can understand more about ourselves and about our community through looking more deeply and thinking more richly and affectionately about the idea of the Trinity. So we'll come back to that. So what is all this stuff, these words that are trying to use to describe the mysterious nature of God, well, this is an important point. Our words are absolutely important when we talk to one another, when we talk about God, when we talk about the deep things that God is revealing about himself. And at the same time, words fall short. Let me quote here from Alistair McGrath, human language finds itself pressed to the limits when trying to depict and describe the divine. That's from his introduction on the doctrine of the Trinity. And as we've seen, light of light, all of these words, homoousius, we're going to get into a minute, they kind of fall short of describing God as he presents himself. And yet, they help. They're limited in clarity, but they help us clarify. More to the debate of what was happening at the Council of Nicaea. The debate actually came over what many people have pointed out, literally, one iota difference. So the Greek word homoousion means like substance. In other words, Jesus isn't 
quite God. The word homoousian, without that iota, means one substance, that Jesus is in fact divine. He is of the Father. They are one. What I want to point out here is that this division, this need for clarification came over one Greek letter. And we should not dismiss Athanasius and Constantine and Arius for having this conversation over one letter, because this is consequential. And this is what I want to get at, is that it's actually really important to define and clarify what we're speaking of when we're talking about our faith, when we're talking about God, our presuppositions, our conclusions. Think of a word that might be difficult to define in today's culture. Think of a word that in two different echo chambers or two different polarities of political thought might mean completely different things and bring to mind two completely different associations. I'm sure you could think of a few. It is important that we clarify with our words what we're trying to say. It's a conversation like what happens at Nicaea, where the fixation over one particular letter can actually build a frame for us to unpacking what we mean and what we mean by what we say. And so oftentimes I have found people who talk in, in two different realms of political thought actually have the same concern and are just articulating it in different ways. So many times the issues that happen in church life, and I would argue in our culture, but particularly in church life, happen over a misunderstanding of language. We need to have the conversational commitment and rigor to stay at the table long enough to define our terms, to find our common ground, and to understand our differences. Did you notice in the brief intro that the Council of Nicaea was an invitation around the globe to come to Nicaea? Invitations to the council were sent out to bishops all over the Christian world. For this reason, Nicaea came to be considered the first ecumenical council or worldwide gathering of bishops. From all over the Mediterranean and beyond, representatives came to discuss the weighty things of God. For whatever challenges that Constantine introduced into the Christian world, it's clear that he valued bringing together the world at one table to discuss the weighty things of faith. Many Christian thinkers today suggest that in line with Nicaea and many other events like Nicaea, that what the world needs is a broader conversation within the global church. That the church as a whole, as an international intercultural entity, needs to gather more often to discuss the weighty things of the faith. Why would it be important to bring together the whole global church? Well, Paul Hybert gives us some really healthy observations. The cultural biases of local churches must be checked by the international community of churches drawn from many cultures. Do you see the advantage here that Paul Hybert is getting at? The idea that we really need the whole church together to see the faith clearly. For example, Christians in America are often blind by how materialistic they are. And we need Christians in other places to, to help us to see that. Just as we might have cultural lenses to see some of another country's cultural bias when they approach Christian practice. And it's in those conversations together that the global church stands to build one another up in faith, or even especially in the challenging topics. I really love what Sung Chan Ra writes about this perspective. There is a great possibility and hope when different cultures come with their various perspectives and insights into the gospel message. In this increasingly global Christianity, and an increasingly diverse American evangelicalism, the promise is of a myriad of expressions of church life that enrich and deepen the next evangelicalism. If we're drinking deeply from the doctrine of the Trinity and we have a glimpse of what kind of beauty happened overall at the Council of Nicaea, we understand the value of bringing to the table Christians from around the world and maybe not literally to the table, although if the opportunity affords, that would be amazing. But are we reading from the black church? Are we reading from 
the Korean immigrant church? Are we reading from the indigenous church? Are we reading from our brothers and sisters in Latin America? Are we reading widely? Or are we only reading from the limited cultural milieu of white American evangelicalism? There's a richer, broader church out there. And we can learn, we can humble ourselves, share the table, and drink deeply from each other's experiences with God. We can more aptly wrestle with deep cultural issues when we bring together the voices of the global church. My hope is that table talks will include perspectives, not just from middle-class white America, but from perspectives we don't often hear in our own church context. One that I hope will increasingly become global in our awareness of how to follow out the gospel, how to read scriptures, and how to talk about the stuff of culture in light of the cross in the global church. One of the principles we learn from the Council of Nicaea and from many other parts of church history is that the challenge in our faith isn't necessarily hammering everything down. Rather, it's holding together the scriptures. Do we really believe the Bible is up to the task of these issues that we wade through, that we find so personal to us, so inflammatory to the culture, so divisive, so challenging for people to trust each other in talking about? Do we believe God has anything to say? Do we believe in the sufficiency of scripture? However, for the time being, we should note that each new generation of Christians does not come to scripture with a clean slate. Whether it acknowledges it or not, each generation approaches scripture wearing spectacles colored by centuries of inherited beliefs and practices. Where scripture has faithfully shaped that inheritance, scripture proves itself sufficient again by being the means through which God speaks again. Where that inheritance includes purely human and thus unbiblical elements, the sufficiency of scripture stands as a call on us to open up all our most cherished beliefs and practices, especially the ones we use to mark our Christian subculture off from other subcultures, to correction by the voice of God in scripture. I think more often than not, what happens in the sticky conversations, the polarizing conversations within the life of the church, isn't fidelity to the text, but it's a piecemealing effort. Some of the earliest church controversies, uh, these are like Marcionism, where a guy named Marcion thought the Old Testament God was the bad guy and Jesus was the hero. What he started to do was to cut out parts of the canon. He decided that Luke's gospel was the best and only really part of it, and much of Paul's letters. And he didn't like all of the Bible, so he just ditched it. And that's where we get into trouble. I find that people on one side of the aisle have an internal canon, and the people on the other side of the aisle have another internal canon. And they don't hold together the whole scriptures, or they would find a lot more common ground in all of their concerns. And so I think the challenge for us, just like it was at Nicaea, was not to oversimplify and flatten and and, and under nuance what God has to say in the scriptures, but instead to commit to holding all of the mystery of God together, even when it's contradictory or confusing and you're not sure how it connects. If it's there, it's what God has chosen to reveal about himself, and we must hold it, even in the mystery. I believe that the Bible touches so many issues, and many of which we hope to dive into in our table talks. And we might not leave with an answer that's easily pasteable or, or, or something that fits on a bumper sticker, but I think we'll understand and see the heart of God when we hold together all of the scriptures. And ultimately, this act of holding together God's revealed word is not just a simple idea of accruing knowledge and understanding. It's something much deeper. Let's go to Kevin Van Hooser, a voice I find so helpful in dialoguing with postmodernism. He says, The church is not the word, but a living commentary. And he quotes from Paul, Let the word of Christ dwell in you 
richly. Do you see the reading of scriptures as we talk about what God views as just or righteous or good? It's not just values that we can load into our polarized echo chambers and spit out facts and knowledge and quote Bible verses as if they were a bludgeon. I'm not a huge fan of the common biblical phrase, application. You apply veneer. You apply makeup. You apply paint. That's thin. I think a more apt phrase to understand what God's agenda through his word is with us is transformation. So interacting with any of these issues, whether it be the doctrine of the Trinity, whether it be creation care, or racial reconciliation, or politics, whatever it is, when we go to scripture, are we willing to be transformed and to live out what God is conveying about himself? The scriptures weren't meant to be read as proof text loaded up in a clip like ammunition. The scriptures were meant to change your character, to challenge every part of who you are, and invite you into the glorious living out of life in the Trinity, life in and with God. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In God's activity now, ultimately the idea of a church council, the idea of gathering together a group of Christians from around the world, or in our context, our church family, and anybody who wants to attend these conversations. We believe that God is working on our hearts now, that he's revealing himself afresh today. When we think about the activity of God in these tough conversations, is he here with us? Is he in the room? Is he in our pursuit, in our quiet time? Is he in our words as we disagree? Well, perhaps in the beautiful contrast that could result from a commitment to unity, we find ourselves representing and engaging in God as we speak. The nature of the church is to be understood as the church of the triune God. This being in the image of the blessed Trinity constitutes the mode of the church's existence, which in fact reveals her nature. I believe through these kind of things, this kind of dogged commitment to unity and diversity, to God himself, that God can move among us to shape us to be more like him. And so our view of God at the outset of this thing, well, the reason we're starting with the doctrine of the Trinity, the idea of God's threeness and his oneness held in perfect togetherness and tension, is that we believe we can do this because God is like this. There is a, a theological aim that we want to adore and to image and to be like God. And here at the table of diverse unity, of unity and diversity, I believe we are in fact even more so embodying the very God we seek together. The Trinity, understood in human terms as a communion of persons, lays the foundations for a society of brothers and sisters, of equals, in which dialogue and consensus are basic constituents of living together in both the world and the church. When we dialogue together, something of God is reflected in our conversation. As we hold together unity and diversity, something of God is being made known. Won't it be a compelling witness, church, when we hold together in unity and diversity of the nature of God to the community around us, to the world? I believe we can image him, reflect him, embody him more fully when we commit to unity and diversity. Christians reflect the life of the Trinity and anticipate the ultimate transformation of this world that God will bring about at the end of history. Guys, we reflect the life of the Trinity and this life of the Trinity is the shape of who we were in the Garden of Eden and who we will be in the new heavens and new earth. We can learn now and preview the kind of diverse unity not only of God, but of the new humanity that God is unfolding among us. 
Are you guys inspired to stay committed to each other at the table, to, to bask in the mystery of God, to pursue clarity, but limited clarity, to invite the global church to shape this pursuit and to, to take off our cultural biases? I believe God can work among us when we meet and remain at the table. I think God in and of himself is a community and we are seeking to image that. Unity and diversity. It's who God is and it's who we want to be too. On the topic of God's activity now, not only making us more like him, not only getting us to participate in his inner life by modeling that among ourselves, there is this sense of God's revelatory aims that he actually wants to make himself known. And it was this kind of optimism that we saw really the first church council, even though Nicaea was a big deal. The first church council, it could be said, was back within the biblical canon in the history book we know as Acts. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to see you. And there, the global church gathered to talk about some really weighty things. Would the church look mostly like messianic Judaism? Or would it be open to Gentile cultural forms and expression? What would they do? Well, they got together and the positions were heard and they talked and they had disagreement and sometimes sharp disagreement. And at the end of the day, here's their report. In a letter they wrote to churches around the world, they said, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I find that verse incredibly compelling. What happened at that table talk, at that conference? Can I have a pamphlet, please, of like how you guys got to that? And at the end of the day, what we have is a glimpse of what God can do. I believe God is just as active now as he was then, as he was in 325 AD, as he is in 2021, as he was at the Jerusalem Council here. God's triunity is active today. The Spirit is drawing us in the Son to the Father. And He is speaking today through His Word, through each other, through the global church. Are we listening? You can't hear it as easily on the echo chambers of social media, on news outlets. You can hear it through the scriptures, and you can hear it at the table of those committed to the mystery of God. Let's do this. Let's find out what is good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I think we can do that together. After we have reflected on all of this, and we have some good principles for tough conversation, I want to add this to bookend our exploration. God is one, but the unity of God is a living unity. It is a unity of plenitude that includes difference and relationship. The Trinity is essentially a koinonia of persons in love. That's just the Greek word for fellowship. As we reflect on how to have deep conversations and do them well, and to engage scripture and to believe in God's revelation that in the process he's revealing himself to the global church and that we can seek precision however limited it may be in articulating who God claims to be and we can walk in faith in that but what I think is maybe the most key the most salient point we can derive from the council of Nicaea is that at the core of our faith is a God who is diversity and unity in our culture we tend to divide these things Unity equals uniformity, and diversity equals division. That is simply too simplistic of a way to view these things. If God in and of himself is somehow unity and diversity, three and one, a triunity, then we must begin to piece together a view of the contrasts, of the differences, of the distinctions that we hold, not as a problem, 
to a degree to problematize the differences and the contrasts that we hold, but in a way to celebrate unity in diversity. I think Ann Carr says it really well, the mystery of God as Trinity, as final and perfect sociality embodies those qualities of mutuality, reciprocity, cooperation, unity, peace, and genuine diversity. Do you guys hear this invitation to be like God, to hold together in contrast? It is not a sign of our Christian weakness if we don't think all the same thing. To be of one mind and to live in unity is not to dissolve all of our difference. For God in and of himself is diversity and unity. Three in one, Father, Spirit, and Son. And somehow, they are more of who they are as a result of their relationship. The Father and the Son, those are relational titles. The Father is the Father because he's a Father to the Son. The Son is the Son because he's Son of the Father. And so in our contrast and our distinctiveness, we may even grow more like we are in unity. I know this sounds esoteric. I know this sounds maybe a bit exploratory. Or maybe it sounds like just a bunch of words. But I hold this to be true. At the center of our faith is the mysterious dance of the Trinity. And we, as a church community, in topics where people land in different places, are invited into the limited clarity of God and His revelation and His Word in our lives and through Him. So may we join together in our diversity and find a unity deeper than uniformity. Let's not be satisfied with fractious divisions, with factions, with, with cutting ourselves off. Let's not be satisfied with that. Let's rejoice in the life of the Trinity and begin to embody and to mirror His image. Unity in diversity. That's my hope for our church family. That's my hope for these table talks as we attempt to dive into some things that are much less essential than the doctrine of the Trinity. Again, the Council of Nicaea dealt with one of the weightiest issues. Who is Jesus in relation to God? I doubt we'll find an issue that consequential that we can dive into. So what's to lose from talking about issues that might be challenging, that might require a deep sense of nuance and a renewed sense of study, a humility that would invite us to listen to the global voices and a commitment to one another in that unity, in that diversity that would allow us to image the very nature, the very mystery of God. Let's come to the table together. Thank you for sticking with this long and winding conversation. This is our study session. This is the educational piece of our table talk to help us wrap our head around some of the things that are going to be healthfully explored at our in-person or Zoom event later this month. And between now and then, there's an additional assignment we want you to do that we believe will really help you because your head might be swimming with ideas or rumblings or thoughts or mysteries. We want you to take those to God in preparation for our time together. So look for this video when you're done with this one. And when you're ready, click it, watch it. It will give you some instructions about how to spend time with God chewing on what we've discussed today. I hope this has been helpful and I hope that God will begin anew, afresh, to image himself and his diverse unity among us at the table as we explore the deep things of God with scripture, with the global church, and with a commitment to the mystery of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Godspeed.